the December 15th, 2015 meeting of the Santa Barbara City Council Finance Committee, and I might add the last meeting of 2015, will now come to order. Are there any members of the public wishing to speak on items not on today's agenda? Seeing none, Mr. Samario. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. We're here to present to you and later on to council the 2015 Comprehensive Annual Financial Report. Um, you know, this is a document that obviously we do every year and its, it's intent is to show the, the financial position of the city overall and individually look at individual funds. Um, it's something that it occurs, you see that's six months after year end, so it's a little bit old in the sense, but it is important information. It's not like the budget where it gets that much notoriety, but it is a document that's important and it, it requires almost as much work as our budget document to put together. Uh, Jennifer Tomaszewski, our county manager this year, first year she started in June and, and right away had to do the work on the year end and then preparing this document. And she put in a lot of hours to get this document along with her staff. And I just want to recognize her because she put uh, more hours than I would like to admit to getting this done and making sure we got it done on time. And she did a great job, so I'm really happy with that. Uh, we are going to have, we do have Mr. Richard Kikuchi. He's a partner with Lancel and Longhard. They're a firm out of um, Brea, California, North Orange County. Um, they've been our auditors for, I think, five years now, maybe not six years. Um, it, the, he works for a firm that's been around for many, many years. You know, it could be 50 years, I'm not sure, but it's been around a long time. Um, and um, so he's going to be covering a small part of it toward the end, sort of expressing or explaining what they do and what the results of their audit works were, was. was. Um, but we'll start with Jennifer. She's going to give you some highlights of the CAFR this year, and then I will follow that with just a brief discussion on our reserves. I gave you a bit of a preview when we did our fourth quarter not too long ago, but I want to show you what the final numbers for the general funds reserves are. And then we'll finish up with uh, Rich to talk about the audit results. Okay. So with that, I'll Great. turn it over to Jennifer. Ms. Tomaszewski. Good afternoon, Chair Francisco and committee members. I'm Jennifer Tomaszewski, the accounting manager for the finance department. And today I will be presenting the comprehensive annual financial report for fiscal year ended uh, June 30th, 2015. Uh, we will be discussing some background information, then I'll go into the layout and contents of the report. We will touch on some financial highlights, some key foot, footnote disclosures, and then some audit, uh, the audit requirements and the results of the, those, uh, the audit. Um, what is a CAFR? It's an annual financial report prepared in accordance with nationally recognized accounting and financial reporting standards, or GAAP, which are generally accepted uh, accounting principles. And uh, it presents the financial condition and the results of operations of the city as a whole and for the individual funds. It is comprehensive because it includes information not required uh, by financial reporting regulations which also qualifies this document for the Government Finance Officers Association Awards Program. And I believe as of last year, we have received that certificate 12 years in a row. So we're going for number 13, lucky number 13 this year. <laughs> um, and of course, it provides information um, to the reader and to the public about information about the city's uh, finances, how the city's doing. Um, why is the CAFR prepared? It's prepared because it's uh, required in the city charter to be audited uh, by an independent CPA. It's required by state law. It's important in issuing bonds. Um, bond rating agencies look at it uh, for assessing credit risk. And it communicates important financial information to the public. There are three sections to the CAFR. The first section is the introductory section, and this includes the letter of transmittal. This is prepared by the finance director, uh, Mr. Samario, and by the uh, city administrator, Bob, um, Paul Casey. And it has other information. It has um, information about boards and commissions, um, an org chart, um, the prior year's uh, certificate, um, but it is considered unaudited. Um, the, fina the financial section is the, se uh, the second section of the report, and it, this is the portion that's covered under the audit opinion. 
uh, it includes the independent auditor's report, um, which Rich Kikuchi will be discussing in more in depth. Um, management's discussion and analysis. This is a comparative analysis from 14 to fiscal year 15. And then the uh, basic financial statements. And then uh, the last section is the notes, which support the information in the basic financial statements. And then the last section is the statistical section. And again, this is unaudited, but this carries uh, 10 years of financial trend data, um, both financial and demographic information. Um, some of the financial highlights. Um, fiscal year 15 was the first year that we implemented uh, GASB statement number 68. So we're going to talk about the impacts of that. Um, we're going to look at government-wide statements. And um, in 2001, GASB 34 was implemented that required government agencies to report on an, on an accrual basis uh, showing assets and liabilities. And the purpose was to have agencies present <coughs> financial information as a, on, on a whole or as a whole in the manner similar to the private sector. Um, so those are the government-wide statements. And then we have um, individual, uh, individual funds or fund financials. And um, those are more short-term focused and reported on a modified accrual basis. And the purpose of these are to report the condition of individual funds. Um, they, these don't include capital assets or long-term debt. Um, so first thing being the main change this year is the implementation of GASB Statement Number 68, which is accounting and financial reporting for pensions. This was adopted back in 2012, but became effective uh, fiscal year 2015. And there are three key changes um, that come with this. Um, the unfunded liabilities of pension, the, the pension obligation is now reported um, as a net pension liability on the face of the financial statements as opposed to just uh, a footnote disclosure. There are also several pages of footnote disclosures as well, um, but we will see the impact of that change on um, the finances. Um, another change is the net pension liability reported on the balance sheet. Um, this equals the liabilities minus the um, market value or fair value of assets now as opposed to the actuarial value, and we'll talk more about that as well. Um, and then there were some additional required disclosures as well. So with this first slide, what we're looking at is the government-wide statement of net position at June 30th, 2015, and we will look at the impacts of GASB 68 here. Um, but you can refer to this on page 27 of the CAFR. And what we have here are two types of funds that we report on. We have governmental activities. These include the general fund, special revenue funds, um, ISFs. There's other governmental funds that um, we include in uh, governmental. And mostly these are uh, associated with local government and they're supported by general taxes, um, franchise fees, um, but they're subsidized by general revenues. Whereas the uh, business type, um, these are your enterprise funds and they are, their operations are um, based on, their operations are funded uh, in, they, they're basically self-funding. They, uh, due to fees or service charges as opposed to taxes. Um, so in this first section, what we see is total assets uh, for the city with both governmental and business type activities ended the year about $1.1 million. Or, I'm sorry, $1.1 billion. Um, and in the second section, you'll see there are actually three categories this year. There are current liabilities of about $29 million, uh, and the net pension liability of $238 million, which is new, and uh, other non-current liabilities. Um, so this is where you're seeing that net, net pension liability. And uh, so this uh, results in total liabilities about 400 and, uh, $448 million, um, to which about half of that is net pension liability. Um, so the results of that are down below in the net pension, which is 
um, assets minus li liabilities. And the majority of this is net investment in capital assets. So this is um, 728 million. And what this, it, this includes capital assets, less depreciation and uh, long-term debt. In the second section, you see restricted of about 85 million. This, um, these are external restrictions imposed by creditors, grantors, contributors, uh, regulations, and about 52 million of this is restricted for affordable housing. And then what you see in the third section, the unrestricted uh, net position, you see a negative amount of 147.8 million, and this is a direct result of um, the GASB 68 as well. Um, if we were to back out the effects of GASB 68, that number would be about 115 million. Um, which is usually um, it's made up of several categories. That's where you would see your um, your non-spendables, such as uh, loans receivables. It would be your committed, like your um, policy reserves. Um, but that what you do see is uh, a negative 147 million. But granted, all agencies are preparing. Uh, everybody has to do this. So, um, but that is going to be. A, a difference that we do see as a result of GASB 68. Do you, does anybody have any questions before I move on? No, please go ahead. Okay. And this is a second slide. This is just the middle section of what we just looked at to show that because that was a little bit hard to see that number. So this is just pointing that out that we do have um, impact of $238 million. Just thought I'd jump in. It's a big number to be putting in our, our balance sheet and, and as a liability. And as Ms. Thomas Chess, you said, everybody's doing it, so everybody knows that this is not just Santa Barbara. Rating agencies are familiar with this, and they're going to, in my opinion, they're just going to discount that away because technically, when you add this, we are, you know, upside down. We, the, really, all of our net position, which measures our health, is committed in investments of, to fixed assets. But if you back off fixed assets, we are in a negative. Um, so it's a big deal, but because you know this is everybody's doing it and everybody's recognized that this is just sort of an attempt to try to improve disclosure and transparency of what are the unfunded liabilities are for pensions and other things like that. Um, this Gazi thought this was important, um, but it's just it's just an awkward thing to be putting in our financial statements, in because it just makes puts us in an upside down position and everybody in the same is in the same boat. So I just wanted to make sure everybody understood mm -hmm. that, Mr. Samaria. Wouldn't it also be true? I assume that the the rating agencies, if they've been doing their work, have been looking at pension liabilities and OPEB liabilities all along. Yes, that is correct. It's in the disclosure. It's not something that's been not talked about. So everybody's well aware of it. They know what, what it is. And I know in recent um, bond issuances that comes up and want to know what's our status on our, on our pensions. And so they know that and they want that information. The fact that it's now in the balance sheet isn't really going to change that substantively, in my opinion. Thank you. Okay, so this next uh, this next slide. This is the government the government wide statement of activities for um, June thirtieth, two thousand fifteen, and um, there's two purposes with this slide. First, it's to identify the fiscal or I'm sorry, the financial position of the city and how it changed during the year, and the other is to identify what governmental activities are being subsidized by general revenues and how much. So you see, you know, governmental activities are made up of administration, public safety, public works, community services, community development. Um, the next column expenses, um, all those programs uh, during the year spent about $149.5 million and they generated pro program revenue of about 71. Uh, million in the third column where you see the net <coughs> that is the amount that is subsidized that's the amount um, that's subsidized subsidized by general revenue such as your taxes franchise fees etc so the 78 million was subsidized by general revenues of approximately 96 million for a change in total net position of about 18 million to the good um, so that's the results 
of governmental activities for the year. And this next slide, statement of activities for business type, this is the same slide with the business type activities. And um, again, um, enterprise funds, they're not relying necessarily on a subsidy and should be relying on rates and program revenues to fund their operations. Um, <clears throat> So in uh, the first column expenses, we spent about 122 million um, in 2015, and revenues were about 119.6 for a deficit of 2.4. And the main driver for that was water. Um, water ended the year about five million um, below what the expenses were. Um, we did talk about that at year end um, due to conservation efforts. They just didn't bring in as much revenue or water sales throughout the year. Um, there were a small amount of general revenues, um, but the total effect, um, the total change in net position was about a deficit of $1 million for enterprise funds. And again, you can see this on page 28 of the report. So that was the government-wide um, financial statements. The next ones that we're going to be discussing are the fund financials and the first one being the general fund. So this is the balance sheet for the general fund. And as you can see on the right, there are no capital assets or long-term debt included in these. And um, the general fund had about $41 million in assets at the end of the year and about $25 million of that was cash and investments about $8 million in lia liabilities, um, for, uh, which resulted in about $33.2 million in uh, fund balance. And you'll see the different categories of fund balance. We have non-spendable, about $4 million. This is loans, receivables, and advances. Um, restricted, about $2.5 million. These were um, external creditors, contributors. These are going to be your encumbrances, um, committed amounts. These are internal, internally constrained um, through formal action by city council. This is where you're going to see policy reserves. And then the last, uh, the last section is assigned. And these are identified for specific purpose and designated by either the city administrator or finance director. These are going to be your uh, capital carry forwards. Um, but we did end the year with $33.2 million in, um, in fund balance. Now this next slide looks at the results for the year of revenues and expenditures for the, for the general fund. And again, this is on page 105 of the report. So in the first column, we have annual budget, and we are comparing that to what the actual results were. And then the third column, we have a budget variance. So in the revenues, the first, uh, the first line item, we budgeted about $119.7 million in revenues, and we ended the year about $118.7. So we were under under budgeted levels by about 911,000, uh, whereas expenditures we were budgeted. Oh, and I should say that with the revenues, the 118,000 or 118 million, that does include 1.4 million in transfers, transfers in. Whereas on the expenditure side, um, we budgeted about 122,000, or I keep saying thousand, 22 million. And uh, we spent about 116 million, and of that, about three million were transfers out. And of that three million, we, that does include the 861 uh, thousand that were identified for uh, surplus to capital for future capital needs. And this ended the the year with a savings to budget of 5.3 million for a net a net excess of 4.4 uh, million. Um, but that's comparing budget to actual. And really what we, what we look at on this one is we see revenues were 118, um, revenues were 118 million and expenditures were 116 million. So there was a 2.3 million excess, which added to our final fund balance. Do we have any? Okay. Yes, Mr. White. Uh, on the uh, mentioning the transfers, can you 
give a little more information on what you're meaning by that? Well, of the three million in transfers, the, so a, transfers. a third of that was um, the the capital surplus. But those are going to be one-time transfers. Those are going to be identified to for capital projects or. Um, do you have any other? Yeah, to from add? where to where. Yeah, so I think so. If we in the budgeted column for expenditures, including transfers, I think includes the amount we transfer every year for our capital program. So we transfer out of our general fund into a capital fund, so that's included in there. Um, it also includes, as uh, Mr. Thomas Shesky mentioned, the eight hundred sixty thousand dollars that was the surplus that we measured, and they said we have we're going to put a quarter of that. Normally it's fifty percent, but remember we decided. In order to close reserves, we're going to send a quarter only over to our capital fund. So that's another 861000 that goes over. That's part of the transfers. And there's other transfers that, that occur that I'm not familiar with yet. I'm going to have to look into it. But primarily it's capital and then the, the surplus that we took a quarter of that we transferred also for capital purposes into a capital fund, separate fund. Okay. Thank you. I can get you more specifics. No, I, I okay. want to be a little more specific on right. the definition. And okay. on that point, so you look at the actual column, the $2.3 million excess, that's revenues over expenditures. That number really was closer to $3 million when you, before you factor in that we transferred over a quarter of that okay. into our capital fund. So, the tr so we had a really good year, particularly on the expenditure side. We know we had vacancies in police, parks and recreation, community development, largely driving those, ex those variances. Okay. So on this next slide, what we're looking at are the self-insurance trust fund and the post-employment benefits fund. Now for the CAFR, um, these are combined for reporting purposes, but we did separate them out for the discussion today. And the reason that we're um, discussing these is because for the last couple years, they've been carrying a deficit uh, net position. Um, the self-insurance trust fund has had higher claims um, higher estimated claims liabil liabilities, and the post-employment benefits fund. Um, let's see. Post were, these were um, actually this fund was new, I think, in 2014. These uh, liability, liabilities used to be spread among all the different uh, funds, and uh, we decided to um, create this internal service fund so that we could see all of those, the effect of all of those. Uh, in one fund, and as you can see, the uh, the uh, OPEB obligation is 16 million uh, at the end of fiscal year 15. Was there any any questions on that? Again, we're only highlighting these because they are in deficit positions. I think we've been talking about the self-insurance trust fund. We've had higher you know higher claims in workers' comp and liability and all that. Um, Eight years ago, we probably had more like $5 million to the good, and that's why we were able to rebate to the general fund and enterprise fund some of those monies during the recession. But we're in a deficit position long term. We're not too concerned because we still have enough cash to kind of deal with the cash flow requirements. We are raising rates in 16. We raised rates to, to, to help mitigate that deficit, and we'll do that over time to make sure we're able to cure that gap. But it's not an immediate problem, but it's something we have to address Particularly, we continue to see more claims and, and more and bigger claims come in. You know, we want to make sure we don't fall too far behind. What makes up the OPEB obligations? Yeah, and that's why I was looking at, at Julie because she did this last year. She almost knows more about this. But essentially, the post-employment benefits are things such as a retired medical payment, where we where employees who, who are with with the city ten years at a minimum, in some cases fifteen they fifteen years they vest. And they will get a stipend when they retire of about two to three hundred dollars, depending how long they're with the city. And we pay that until age 65. It's to offset their insurance costs. So that's something we're supposed to recognize as a liability uh, in our books. It also includes for us um, the um, sick. the sick leave. When people retire, they get a sick leave benefit. And so we're supposed to recognize the fact that that over time we should be accumulating monies for those kinds of payouts at the end of the year, even though it's a one-time payment versus an ongoing payment for the rest of the life, like some pensions are or up to age 65. So we have to recognize that as a liability as well, the how much we should have in the bank to pay for all that. So those are the two primary drivers in there. And so it's something that's just a big number. We know that we're not going to, we're not going to fund it anytime soon, but we did create this fund a couple of years ago to try to make some progress on that. 
And we also have created, created this fund to put money aside for, for the fact that when people retire, they, we do have a large payout for sick leave and vacation, and it has a budgetary impact to us. That we, so we don't budget for those things, and, it, and it's just hard to absorb that. So rather than having those big hits and coming to councils for appropriation authority, we try to fund those over time so everybody contributes to that based on how, what their history has been for vacation and sick, camp, sick leave payouts, and that way we don't see this budgetary impact. It's just kind of an allocated cost that they pay or a premium they pay into, this, into the system. We've had some larger payouts, so that's why you see you only have eighty-one thousand dollars in there. But we've been funding, so, you know, up to a million dollars per year in that, and it's just, we just have these payouts that occur. Um, but the idea is to start building up some money toward those that sixteen million dollar liability, um, and hopefully over time we can even increase how much we put aside every year. Um, it's a liability that we should be we should be accumulating money for, just like we do for our our, our pension or PERS system. It's good to be you know pretty close to being fully funded. We're not nearly there. Everybody's in the same boat. But you know, we thought we'd try to make some progress towards that. Hopefully, that helps. We've got a long way to go between eighty-one thousand and sixteen million. It's not two hundred million. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, now we um, will look at some of the key footnote disclosures. Um, you're probably familiar with this slide. Uh, one of the key areas uh, for footnote disclosures is obviously pension plans. And the purpose of this slide is to show the city's funded status in pension plans with CalPERS. So this is for fiscal year 15 with a valuation date of June 30th, 2013. In the first column, the accrued liability. This is the amount we should have in the bank right now to fund all current obligations. And in the second column, the market value of assets, this is also new with GASB 68. This is where you would have seen actuarial value in the past. Um, actuarial, um, the actuarial values, would, these tended to be a little less volatile over time and tended to have a smoothing effect um, as changes occurred, but they were slower to also react when the market um, uh, when the market did change. Um, so the, one of the requirements now is that we do uh, report as uh, the market value. The third... Ms. Tomaszewski, a question about that. Do we know what the actuarial value would have been there? Um, we we did not get reported on that. It didn't... The actuarial reports didn't present that way. They were presented with the market values. Yeah, they're really not generating that information anymore because it's not a required disclosure. But it would be a number that would show that as being a lot higher than the market value. Because mm -hmm. when the market drops, it's, as Ms. Tomaszewski indicated, it's slower to react, so it's artificially higher. And times when things are, you know, changing the other direction, they're artificially low. But it's really not a good picture of what our funded status is. So, you know, we've, I've always presented to you the market value anyway, along with the actuarial, to show you what the true picture was. And now they're, they've recognized it themselves that let's not play games with the numbers, let's show the true market value, that's the required disclosure now, so people have a good sense of today, what's our funded status. And so is, is the true market value if we, had, if we had to suddenly get rid of all those assets? Exactly. Okay. okay. Um, and again, as uh, the market value shows uh, a more conservative or a lower number with the assets, the funded status is actually... Um, higher now. Um, let's see. This, the third column, the unfunded liability, this is the difference between your accrued liability and your market value. Um, yes, yeah, so this is the difference between the two. Um, this gives the funded status of, of about 71.6 million to 74.7 million. Or, I'm sorry. <laughs> there I go. I, I got the million now. <laughs> um, this is higher than the market value reported last year, and we do have last year's market value on the next slide. So you see last year the funded status was between 69.3 and 70 percent, and now that funded status is higher. Um, then we look at the annual covered payroll, which is the total payroll for which these rates are based on, and then we look at the unfunded li liability as a percentage of that payroll. And the reason that this is important is because as there's a smaller pool, you have a higher risk. 
So, uh, for example, fire, it's a smaller base of 10 million in payroll. It has a higher risk. Is there any questions? Does that make sense? Understand that, why there's a higher risk for that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I do have a question. Um, I've, I've asked about the, the purchasing of, of uh, five years of, of uh, retirement time in the past. And I, as I understand it, that's not, we don't know how many people have done that. So how do they quant? I mean, that's, that's as much as um, a sixth of a person's career, shall we say, right? So that could add a sixth to the liability. And yet we don't know how many people have done that. So I'm just I'm curious yeah. if it's not quantifiable. It is, it is information that we cannot get from PERS. I mean, PERS has that information, but we don't have access to that information. But when people do buy what's called airtime or did buy airtime, it's no longer allowed under PEPRA, but they were able to buy up to five years of, air, of service credit. But they also paid for that, and, and PERS would do a calculation as to what, what the impact is on their liability. So whatever the impact of the liability is, that employee had to provide them with that money to cover that cost. So it would be a cost-neutral impact. There shouldn't have been any impact. Obviously, you know, going forward, there could be volatility in the actual investment returns, but in the moment they do the calculation, they're paying what it is actually to, to fund that additional five-year service credit. Yeah, I just, so that the numbers here are, are PERS numbers, they're not our numbers. Okay. Any other questions? Mr. Hart. Well, isn't, I mean, I think it's a better characterization is that there are no R numbers. There are PERS numbers that matter, but there is no obligation to the city as an entity. It's an obligation through PERS to make those retirement um, payments. So I don't know that making a distinction between us and them is, is an, anything relevant. Well, I, I, and maybe that's maybe uh, uh, my understanding is that this is our obligation and that if so that's so that's that's why it's our obligation yeah pers is pers administers this plan so they are responsible for investing the monies they collect from the from the participants and they're responsible for paying out the benefits and they're responsible for telling us how much we owe based on the assumptions that they make and and where those assumptions go wrong we have to make adjustments but it, it's 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 our money. They're just holding it in trust. It's really the the, the money of the beneficiaries mm -hmm. in reality because we can't access that money. But it's their information they just provide to us and, and that make up these disclosures. We don't have access to a lot of detail information because that's between PERS and the beneficiary or the employee. Um, so that's why we don't have access to how many people bought airtime and all that. But yeah, these are our obligations, and the assets are what's accumulated for those obligations, and they're that's what their role is just to administer the program. Okay, so in the next slide, and that was, again, just the prior year information. Um, the next footnote, uh, footnote number 17, you can see this on page 75 through 79. These are the other retirement benefits. Um, there are three, specifically the retirement medical. Again, we kind of talked about some of this. The city uh, provides a monthly retiree um, medical insurance contribution benefit to retired employees um, based on certain criteria. And then there's the implied subsidy. Um, again, retirees covered under the city's plan receive pre-age 65 benefits that are subsidized as the cost of the coverage is based on blended rates for active and retired employees. And then uh, sick leave. The city gives additional retirement benefits for uh, unused sick leave for those who retire uh, with CalPERS pension benefits. Um, but we don't uh, fund the implied subsidies. Uh, we are required to report on those. Uh, we are looking at the uh, OPEB fund and in our earlier discussion. Our plan is not to fund those uh, subsidies. And I think Mr. Samario might want to give some information the, the, there. The implied subsidy is a really a weird liability that we're required to disclose. I, I think it's silly in my opinion. So because our, our retirees are able to participate in our group insurance plan and, and, and have access to the same premium rates that we as active employees get, um, 
they effectively are, are paying a lower rate than it, that they would if they were separately rated or went out and got their own insurance plan. So that differential, whatever that might be for them, you know, it's pretty substantial to uh, with the impact to us, the individuals is pretty small when you spread it across all the rest of the employees. But everybody else in the city primarily is in the city essentially is paying a little more because we're essentially subsidizing these retirees. So Gasby and in their infinite wisdom says we need to not only recognize that obligation, but start putting money aside like a pension every year to accumulate so that when somebody effectively eventually retires and gets this benefit, we have the money to cover it. Even though there's no real money being exchanged, it's just a lower rate that they get and it's paid for from higher rates that our employees pay. So this is the 19.8 is the money that we're supposed to have in the bank for existing employees to uh, accumulate it so that when they eventually retire, we would be um, having the money in the bank. And it also includes, of course, the unfunded portion for because we have never been accumulating monies for those existing retirees and for I mean, active retirees. So we're, we're behind. But again, we don't look to try to fund this. Some cities are doing this to put money in a trust to try to fund these OPEBs, but we're, we're not wanting to do that because we think it's, it's just this artificial liability that's, that'll never really be paid out in a sense. It's just reflected in higher rates that the city pays for active employees because we're to provide lower rates for our retirees. It's a complicated one. I don't know if that makes sense, but it's, it's, a, it's an odd one. So the, the implied subsidy then, so that's the difference between what a city retiree who is taking advantage of remaining a part of the group right. rate, right. it's the difference between that rate and what supposedly that same person would pay if he had to get individual that's coverage. And, yes. And but it's not, it's not a real cost right. because we're paying it as we go through higher rates for everybody else. And to make it worse, is let's, and I'm just going to make a number, let's say that for all our active retirees, it works out to be a $100,000 differential, right? between what they would have paid and what, what they are paying. Rec because the fact that we, w we have this benefit that's going to be available to existing employees, somebody who's 30 years old today may participate and take advantage of this benefit. We're supposed to be putting money aside for that individual today so that when they retire, the money is available to pay off this, this, this benefit, the value of, of say, $100,000 in a given year. It's this weird thing that we're supposed to accumulate the monies now for active employees so that when they retire, the, like a pension, the money is there. Even though we won't be writing a check, we'll just be providing a lower rate to them. And even more important than that, the reason we don't sort of treat it as a true liability is that any given Tuesday, council, although it's, it's, it's something that's going to have an, an impact on it from a union perspective, but there's no contractual obligation for the city council to provide this subsidy. In fact, you know, with, a, with the Affordable Care Act, they may be able to, to get the same rate on, under other programs and not without even participating in our program. So they may be able to get access to even cheaper or comparable rates and, and, and health insurance than what they're paying and provided for by the city today. So it's something we're going to be looking at, but it's something that council could theoretically change on any given Tuesday if they wanted to. Mr. White? So uh, that's not a something that's negotiated in um, with with employees as part of their uh, you know I don't contract. believe so I don't believe it is okay now we are going to move on to reserves and again I will hand it over to mr. Samario so we are now looking at final numbers for 15. We, we came to you earlier and we told you we were really close. We're effectively closed and we had closed the gap. But these are the final numbers now. So um, our two reserve categories, disaster reserves, represents 15% of the operating budget for 16. So at, for as of June 30, 15, we look at the 16 operating budget and calculate 15%, and that works out to 18.3 million. And then the contingency reserve is 12.2 or 10%. And what we actually have now in reserves are fully funded with a little bit of surplus, $33,000. So um, as I mentioned before, this is the first time in many years that we've actually closed the gap in reserves. Um, and this does already factor in the fact that we transferred $861,000 from those monies into the capital. Remember, we said we wanted to do 25% 20, instead of 50 so just to remind you that during the budget process, we said that we would try to get there within two years. We thought we could get there within two years by 2017, and we had a plan in place. Well, we're there. Um, and the only thing I will tell you is that we, we're looking at our revenues, and I mentioned this to you last time, that our revenues are a little bit shaky. Um, so um, 
I'm, I'm hoping we can stay fully funded in the next two years. I think for, for 17, as we're projecting today, so next fiscal year, we, we think we're going to still maintain fully funded status, including this year, um, but I'm not sure. 17 is the sort of the wild card. 18 may be a little more uncertain. But today, or at least as of June 30, we are fully funded. I think that's great news. And I just noticed that's a typo on the bottom. It is not 861,000 million. <laughs> that would be a lot. <laughs> the next slide is just a pictorial of that same thing. So this shows you in 2008 where we were. And, and this actually, that gap goes all the way back to 2006, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. So 10 years later, we're fully funded. Good news. Okay. Uh, and I guess that, uh, by way of just being transparent, you know, the one thing that's uh, that's kind of a wild card is this um, this Roland Jacks case. This is where they they filed a lawsuit against that additional one percent surcharge or on our franchise fee on our electric services. Uh, I know Ariel feels pretty com feels optimistic that we will win in that case. That's going to be heard by sometime in the next mm -hmm. summer by the Supreme Court. Um, we won in the trial court, lost an appeal, mm -hmm. but he feels confident. But that's an exposure we have there, you know, it, and depending on how far back we have to go, that could be a couple million dollars. Okay, um, this next slide, um, this is the streets infrastructure uh, pavement condition index. We wanted to bring this to your attention as it is a potential unfunded li liability for the city. Uh, under accounting standards, we must disclose this information uh, of the condition of our pavements. And you can see this on pages uh, 107 through 109 of the report. Um, this schedule shows the pavement condition index and the estimated cost to keep the pavement at a level of 70 and our actual expenditures each year. Um, the overall condition of the pavement condition in, uh, index has been on the decline uh, due to uh, a lack of funding. Um, there was a slight jump in fiscal year 14 as the former state route 225 was relinquished to the city in good to excellent condition. Um, however, it is uh, still on the decline. I, the only thing I'll add is you might recall last year when we saw this bump up from 63 to 64 when we were saying we were on a decline. The reason it went up was not because of anything different we're doing or more we're doing. It's, it's because the methodology that's been used and how we calculate the PCI or how engineering folks do changed that are just sort of bumped that up to 64. Uh, so 64 was really a change in methodology, but this year it went down. So we're, we're essentially still on a downward trend um, from 2011. Basically, if you look at the difference between the expenditures and what we should be to maintain a 70% PCI, it's it's a big gap there. So, a question about that: If so, let's look at 2014-15. The difference between the estimate and the expenditures is about four million. So, if we had actually spent an additional four million in that year, would that have brought us to 70? You know, that's a good question. I don't believe that's true. I think that you have to see that for a, for a while. You, I don't think you can cure it all in one year by just adding four million. I think it's going to require for a number of years putting in that kind of uh, seven and a half million dollar funded or funding. Mr. White, thank you. Uh, a comment in uh, more than a question, and and that is that we had the. Uh, the, I just am hoping that the loop has closed on the PCI question I uh, that we had. It, um, um, a, a staff report um, six weeks, two months ago on PCI and where it was re was described, our PCI was described as good and that there was a um, um, Katie, what's, what's Katie's last name? Works in your office. Kate, Kate. She used to be Katie. Uh, anyway, Ms. Wan made a presentation to council where she was describing uh, a host of things, including PCI. And, and, and I recall this even, uh, if I may, back to you, uh, Mr. Samario, many years, let's say five years ago, describing our PCI. And, and I'm just, it seemed like there was a disconnect between this at-risk uh, description here and perhaps another description of, of what PCI refers to. And it's, uh, it's one of those areas of messaging as much as anything. I mean, everybody knows what's happening with the streets, but to have the messaging out there consistent 
is obviously sure. important. And uh, not that we're saying one day that our roads are fine and the next day that they're falling apart kind of thing. We want to get on a, on a right on a trajectory that everybody is 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 in with. Well, I believe that this information comes directly from Public Works. They have to prepare a report, and I, I want to say it's every other year. Mm -hmm. And um, when we do prepare the CAFR, we do get in contact with them and get their feedback before mm -hmm. we report on this. And as I recall, last year was the first time in, the, in our CAFR where the term at risk was used mm -hmm. to describe our streets. And uh, so that's... It's important for everybody to, to, to who's working with this document, who's working with the city, to be able to understand the the, the need for the for the investment and right. all that sort of and thing. And hopefully, between I'm not sure we're going to show this particular slide at our, our council meeting today, but it may be between now and then, or if not later, we'll get a clarification as what what does it mean to be in the 60s? Because I think that's the range: 60 to 70 is either good or not good or at risk. Clearly, what we want to be is above 70, and the issue is we're dropping, and that's the trend line is what's the, of a concern. Once you fall below 60, I think that's when you really get into some, have some concerns. I do believe that anything below 71 is defined as at risk, mm -hmm. but we do also establish a minimum uh, PCI of uh, 60 uh, in in the city. Yeah, for that's for reporting purposes. You know, we are we are allowed to, to skip a whole lot of accounting. Mm -hmm with regards to our streets if we maintain a PCI above 60 because the whole idea is that the, the guys we said we should be disclosing the condition of our, of our streets and if they are still in, are in good shape then we don't have to do all this actual accounting of how much we spend how much is depreciated and all that but when we fall below 60 we have to then start getting a lot more information to the public about okay how much are we really spending what's the true depreciation and and how much are we you know all that so for us it's a critical threshold if we fall below 60 because it poses more accounting requirements on us I have a related question. On page 182, there's a chart that talks about operating indicators by function. And then under public works, there's a street surfacing table that goes across for the past 10 years. And there's an enormous variation in the number of miles that are surfaced in any given year. You know, the highs in the 70s and 75 going down to 24 miles this last year. In fact, there's a real trend where it drops off from 85 in fiscal year 2012 to 26 to 32 to 24. Could you, do you have any information about that and what that means? I, d I don't at this time, but I can definitely follow up and get back to you on that. That'd be helpful. Thank you. Um, moving on, the last section that we'd like to uh, present today is the audit requirements and the results. Um, the objectives of the audit are to express an opinion as to whether the financial statements are fairly presented in conformity with uh, GAAP accounting and review and evaluate the internal control procedures. Um, the audit results. The city received an unmodified audit opinion, which is a clean opinion. Um, no disagreements with city management. Uh, there were no material weaknesses or significant deficiencies in internal controls and uh, no indications of fraudulent or inappropriate activities. Um, that, or? No, actually, we didn't really... Uh, I, I think we're both going to speak to this. <laughs> I'll hand it over to Rich. <laughs> well, good afternoon, members of the committee. Thank you for inviting me today. Uh, my name is Rich Kikuchi, and I'm a partner with LSL CPAs, your auditors, for the annual visit. And so, yeah, Bob and Jennifer um, shared with you a lot of financial information that transpired at June 30, 2015. And a lot of that information was is there for you to make management decisions since you are leading the city. And so, you know, when I, when I step back and, and want to share what the main objective of the audit is, it is primarily as an independent third party coming in and uh, making sure that those numbers are materially correct. And so 
Uh, that's what myself and my team did. We were here um, in the month of May, and at that time we looked at the internal controls of the city, those policies and procedures set in place by the city to um, uh, you know, record the, the accounting information and to make sure that the system detects or corrects any errors in that system and also the policies and procedures set in place to safeguard the assets of the city. And so uh, we spent a lot of time on the internal controls of the city of Santa Barbara. And if during the course of that assessment, we felt that there were any material weaknesses, as Jennifer mentioned, or significant deficiencies, anything that we felt you know, was a weakness, we would report that in that separate letter that we issued to you, and uh, so I, yeah, I want to I want to corroborate that we had no material weaknesses or significant deficiencies uh, in the audit. Um, I don't know what that next is. There another slide? Actually, is is that it? That okay, good. that's fine. So, you know, when we when we look at the CAFR, it really is a snapshot of your of your financial results as of June 30, 2015, and throughout the year, I know. You know, I'm only here a couple times during the year, but I know every month you're going over financial information, you're going over the budget, and so you want to make sure that those numbers are materially correct so you can make decisions on that. So we do a lot of test work in order to uh, corroborate that those financial results are uh, accurate on the books. And so as a result of the audit, we we have a an auditor's opinion letter in that in that CAFR. And so basically, uh, well, we've issued an unmodified opinion. And I know you guys know, know what that means. It used to be unqualified, but now it's unmodified. So, um, you know, we're, I'm saying that th there wasn't any um, aspects of the audit that we felt were unsubstantiated. Because as an auditor, it is possible that, you know, we could do the whole audit and, for instance, there was an issue with capital assets that we felt, you know, it's we can't test it or we feel uncomfortable with it. We could issue a modified opinion where everything else looks good, but we would just modify it just for the capital assets, capital assets section. Um, but that wasn't the case. We did an audit of the entire city, uh, all the different funds that were alluded to the gov uh, on the government-wide, all the the governmental funds, the proprietary funds, and uh, we feel comfortable with those amounts, and so we've issued an unmodified opinion um, on the CAFR again. And so, uh, like Bob mentioned, it was a team effort. There was a lot, a lot of work that went into this year's audit. The GASB 68 uh, implementation was quite a bit of work. We did a fair amount. Actually, we did a lot of test work. My staff did on the on all the payroll information that was transmitted to PERS. We tested some PERS records uh, in order that we would feel comfortable that that net pension liability reported on your CAFR uh, is materially correct. So we did that not only at interim, but then also at year end too. And then we, you know, we worked with the city finance department to properly record that on your financial statement. So uh, it was a, uh, it was a lot of work this year, but uh, we, we feel comfortable with it and we're happy with the product. And so in general, or in summary, the audit went very well. Uh, no material weaknesses, no significant deficiencies, no indications of fraud. You know, that's, that's actually a separate test work that we're required to do every year, interviewing um, different people within the city, and we kind of rotate that every year. And so uh, we feel comfortable with it. And so. Uh, uh, that's kind of the audit in a nutshell, and I am here to answer any questions about the audit. Although I was thinking when Bob mentioned about LSL, and uh, we were actually formed in 1929. <laughs> so I was thinking, how long is that? That's 86 years, <laughs> for the record. <laughs> Mr. Hart, I have a different unrelated question. Um, about page 169, the general governmental tax revenues by source, so if I'm understanding this, this charts the property taxes in that column that going back to 2006, it's page 169. And it's, it's, if that's true, so that's $27 million worth of property taxes in fiscal year 2015. Is that right? Uh, 
I see 27.7 million, 27,691. Yeah. That, yeah. Um, I guess the point I'm making is that, um, you know, it, it, it would seem to me that property taxes should have grown by a much more significant amount in the past three years with the market recovering. And I think this sort of implies back to what you had mentioned previously at another council meeting about the county not being as quick to reassess properties that have um, increased in value as they were to decrease them when they decreased in value. And it is a big number when you look at the peak of the market, $42 million versus the 27 today. And so, yeah, that we didn't see, we never saw a decline in property tax revenues even during this great recession, we saw it flatten out. The reduction there has to do with the fact that we lost about 20 some million dollars at the time of our D8 uh, okay. tax increment. That's what I was thinking too. Okay, thank you. So that's attributable, attributable exclusively to the yes. redevelopment agency loss of yes. property tax revenue. Yeah. Okay. And as I mentioned for 2016, we're, we're going to see about a 6.5% growth in our property taxes. So we're starting to see some of that property recapture. Okay, thank you. Mr. Cucci, I have a question about the audit. So you mentioned that there was a lot of work involved in making sure that the numbers were right for GASB 68. Yes. I assume that a lot of that work, it was because you did it the first time, but that will be repetitive, reusable, whatever the framework you set up in future years. There was a lot of, there was a learning curve this first year. However, every year we are going to be required to do uh, test work on the census data, you know, making sure that the amounts transmitted to PERS as far as employee information, wages, you know, uh, age, that that's correct. So we will have to do that from year to year. And actually, it's actually a part of the system of internal controls that the city should be monitoring that as well, that information is being transmitted. So uh, there is going to be a fair amount of work moving forward, but the first year was definitely the biggest mm -hmm. yes okay and, and in fact we are because now we are getting the census data, census data information every year because it's required by PERS to submit that uh, we are internally going to be looking at those just like Mr. Kikuchi indicated we should have our own systems in place and I've worked with the HR already about we should be doing some kind of monthly look at these things either on a sample basis or doing something so that we're not just relying on the auditors to make sure that those numbers are correct but that they are in fact correct from our perspective mm -hmm. Um, and they, we're hoping to do a larger sample than what maybe the auditors might do. Mm. I do want to mention. Basis. I do want to mention, Mr. Samara has been very proactive on that. We actually had a, a meeting. I forget what the individual was when we, we had the audit with HR, but uh, yeah. But you know, um, our firm specializes in the audits of cities. We do a lot of cities in California, and it, we've maintained that it is the city's responsibility to set up a system of internal controls to monitor that and actually Santa Barbara is the only city that I have that actually set up a meeting to discuss that, to re, to uh, emphasize that with uh, other cities departments. So, uh, you know, hats off to you. Very good. Any other questions? Then I would entertain a motion to recommend accepting the CAFR. Right. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. And we'll have a, an abbreviated version of this report to council. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you. Meeting adjourned. <laughs>